So very happy to be back. And we have an exciting program this afternoon. And um, first, I'm going to do the poll very quickly since it's up. Uh, you had a little bit of a hint to this yesterday from Cheryl's presentation. I don't know if anybody quite remembered. Um, but the Earthquake Brace and Bolt program, as a reminder, is the program where we provide up to $3,000 to homeowners throughout California to retrofit their homes. So it is that FEMA P1100 retrofit. And we've asked you what the median brace and bolt retrofit in California is. So uh, Jasmine, if you could show the results, please. Look at that, perfect. Um, I'm hoping that there are some CEA people that brought that, that uh, average up. Uh, so the idea here is I wanted to, to, to describe to you, 15,000 is what a lot of people think that retrofit is. The reality is that the median throughout the state is 5,000. Now the good news is that the median in Southern California, and so we're in the Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, San Bernardino area, is $3,900. So you can imagine that $3,000 grant goes a long way. The bad news is in the San Francisco Bay area, the median is over $7,000. And part of this is the cost of living increases from the Bay area. The other part is that the houses are just simply more complicated. Tend to uh, less often be stem wall, more often be cripple walls. Um, configuration, a little bit more hillside going on. Um, so we're constantly battling that price in Northern California and we hope to introduce a low income program very, very soon. And of course that will be a big impediment. So uh, thank you very much, Jasmine. So we can close that. And now um, before I introduce our next speaker, I wanted to take a moment um, to, with all of your permission to, to dedicate this afternoon's program to Steve Mayen. Uh, Yusuf explained that Steve was, was integral to the, the creation of the response to our RFPQ. Um, I remember distinctly his smiling face at the interview. Uh, Steve was, as Yusuf said, the, the ideas guy. And um, he, is, he is both um, the technical, uh, we'll say angel or, or mentor to all of us on the peer project as well as to the Sim Center projects that you're going to see today. So um, it is wonderful to in invoke, I hope, um, his memory. He, we, we lost Steve I, uh, just shortly after the project was awarded. And so um, we miss him and uh, dedicate this afternoon to him. And so now I'm, I'm going to introduce to, to you our next speaker. Frank McKenna is um, gonna talk about earthquake data collection. And Frank, I have to apologize. I don't have any bio information on you other than you are the guy that's, that's gonna bring clarity. And um, as I said, I have great hopes for this, um, this technology and um, I'll just turn it over to you now. And don't forget everyone, Q&A is open. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Janelle. I'm just trying to get control of the screen here. I'm just trying to, sorry about this. You should be able to just click on the, the slide somewhere. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not working like it was when we did that test run. Uh-oh. Maybe he's got too much crap open here. There you go. Is that working? I'm... I just warn you, there may be a little bit of a delay, but, okay. but you don't know there's a delay, so just punt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks everybody. My name is Frank McKenna. I'm here at UC Berkeley, working for the Neary Sim Center. Um, and in this session on um, data collection and use, um, I'm going to present the Sim Center software with an emphasis on what we're doing with data collection and usage, which is pretty much the second half of the presentation. So the Sim Center, um, you know, this is not my work. Um, so let me quickly give the, you know, ditto to out, to out to the, the different people involved. Sim Center has two co-directors, Greg Sanjay, Greg and Sanjay. Um, we have. Uh, a number of co-PIs, Asan Kareem, Laura Lowe's, and Satish Rao. There is a associate director who looks after the running of the Sim Center, that's Matt Shuttler. We have an awful, an awful lot of senior faculty who are involved in guiding, you know, what the different applications we work on are and um, test them out for us. And then finally, we have all the programmers, mostly professors, 
and postdocs who actually implement the software and write software. And I'm one of those programmers. So the outline of my talk today, um, I'm gonna quickly give you an overview of the Sim Center, just to show where, 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 where we're coming from. Um, then I'm gonna demonstrate the, or talk about the building level applica applications that Sim Center releases. Then I'm gonna go into the regional level application. And then finally, the inventory collection. This is where we're using AI and machine learning um, to fill in some of the blanks for our regional level applications. So let me start with the Sim Center, an overview. Sim Center is one of 12 facilities that make up NERI. NERI is an NSF funded project that stands for the Natural Hazards Engineering Re Research Infrastructure. The important thing here is we, we are infrastructure, the facilities are infrastructure. They provide resources to researchers and en practicing engineers is what their function is. Typical um, facilities are the experimental facilities, shake tables, of centrifuge tests, um, wave tanks, and wind tunnels. These are providing, again, the facilities for the researchers to use. In addition, we have some reconnaissance facilities which provide equipment for researchers who are going on um, to look at an area that after a, a disaster is struck. Finally, all the data from the experimental facilities and the recon facilities, they go to a facility called DesignSafe. DesignSafe stores all the data collected from the experiments or, or the reconnaissance. And DesignSafe also provides HPC resources. These are um, powerful supercomputers that allow people to, to run to crunch numbers. Um, they provide access to STAMP-P2 and another si upcoming system called Frontera that give users access to over 500,000 cores to, on which to run their simulations or process their experimental data. I say the Sim Center is sort of the last of the facilities. And we're a, what Sanjay likes to say, a virtual experimental facility. We don't actually have any hardware. What the Sim Center does is produce software. This software is made available to the researchers, industry and government agencies. The software runs on their desktops, but most importantly, it also runs on these HPC resources. So now let me quickly talk about the software. The software, its purpose is to transform the nation's ability to understand and mitigate the effects of natural hazards. The natural hazards that Sim Center is restricted to, shall we say, are earthquakes and hurricanes, both wind and storm surge. We don't deal with land, land fire, nor do we deal with flood. They are other federal funded agencies look after those hazards. And Steve Mahan, who was the original PI on this project, you know, he liked to say that this project is grounded in the present. It has a five-year focus. That five years basically the length of this project. We're currently ending the year four and starting year five of the project. But ultimately, it was a 20-year vision. You know, we're laying the groundwork for stuff we hope will be done routinely in 20 years from now. But at some point, somebody has to start. And Steve decided, you know, let's this project, let's start building the groundwork for what we're gonna be doing in the future. And that's what pretty much what this project is all about. So our promise to NSF was we develop an open source computational framework. That framework would be for building workflow systems. Those systems would support decision-making um, in natural hazards. And we're also those, these systems are gonna also deal with uncertainty. There's an awful lot of uncertainty in natural hazards engineering. And that the focus of, one of the focuses of this, these projects is building applications that deal with uncertainty. The framework itself is gonna be designed so that researchers could come along and add new components into the system. Sim Center is gonna seed the framework with both data and interfaces to existing code so that it can be used now, you know, before the end of the, the project. And then we're gonna seed the framework with enough, provide enough applications so that re researchers can start um, using the applications that we provide. They don't have to build their own applications. They can start using the applications that we provide. And finally, we hope through our applications and also our, our test beds and 
other things that we do that will provide a, an ecosystem whereby researchers in natural hazards engineering can collaborate with each other. So one of the main things we're doing is building these work, scientific work workflow systems. Um, so let me just quickly to show you what a scientific workflow system is. It's something that allows you to build and launch and monitor the, the running of a scientific workflow. And really what a scientific workflow is, is basically a number of distinct applications. Um, they all run independently. When one application spits out some output, the software will take that output and provide it as input to the next application in the workflow. So Steve, what he do, you know, when he, when he's describing this to NSF, he came up with this um, this analogy of a jigsaw puzzle, and basically the different applications, the different components of the the workflow are these jigsaw pieces, and users are allowed to swap whatever jigsaw pieces they want, um, depending on what sort of simulation they want to do. So because of the type of systems we're building, the applications, we really split them all into two. We have a front-end user interface, which in which the user sort of builds the workflow they run at one or run. And then we have this back-end, which is the workflow management system. And that's the software that will start up and run the, the, the different applications when people are running the workflow. So here, for example, I'm just showing here, so the different jigsaw pieces, somebody was wanting to do a regional simulation. They could have different applications for picking the buildings for the hazard, for modeling, and also determining the losses. And then what they could do is that they could sort of mix and match the workflow that they want to run and have a look at the results. So each one of these pieces is interchangeable. So let me briefly show you the SimCenter software. So as I mentioned, the, the work, these workflows are built from components. So in the different components, we have a number of different things we're dealing with. We're dealing with uncertainty quantification. We're dealing with building models of a structure. This is our SAM. We're dealing with different events. We got earthquake events, we got hurricane, we got tsunami and storm surge. So we need to get loadings on the buildings from these different events. We're also dealing with different applications for doing the finite element modeling of the of the event. And then finally, we have you know, different ways of doing the damage and loss calculations. So these, these were our interfaces, our, our abstract classes, if you know anything about object-oriented programming. And then we're building applications that meet these interfaces by bringing in external applications, applications that already exist. To bring in an external application, we're just basically writing pre and post processors for existing applications. And we're also pulling in data um, from the web, as I will demonstrate when we get to the, to the regional simulations. And then finally, once we have our components and we have you know, applications which we can start calling, then we can start building our applications. And this is what we've been doing for the last two years now. We've actually been putting these um, puzzle pieces together to allow us to build applications that users can start, start using. Um, right here, I'm showing five applications, maybe six. And currently, we, we've released everything but RD2, RDT and H2O UQ. So these are applications that people can download and start using now. So the first four, these are the building level applications, applications for looking at the response of Individual buildings, they can also be used for lifelines and other things. So let me quickly go over the, the four different applications. The first application, QuoFem, here we're combining that UQ and FEM applications. The FEM applications people can currently use are OpenSeas FEEP and OpenSeas Pi. Because OpenSeas Pi and is a Python, as an interface to a Python interpreter, and OpenSeas is an interface to a Tickle interpreter. In actuality, users can um, use whatever finite element application they want, and they can use OpenSeas or the Python script to actually invoke an external finite element application and get the input ready for that application. 
So for the UQ, we're looking at methods from a number of different resources. Our primary resource is an application called Dakota from Sandia National Labs. We just started looking at UQ Pi. Um, the Sim Center is also implementing algorithms that are, that are ex exposed in the literature. And then finally, Joel Conte at UC San Diego is, he's got his own team working on different UQ methods. So we're just incorporating them into our applications. And these UQ methods bring in sampling, sensitivity, reliability, parameter estimation, and Bayesian calibration. For earthquake engineering, we're including the sampling, sensitivity, and reliability methods from the UQ, from our UQ components. And we're then incorporating different modeling and earthquake options for the building modeling. We're using open seas. We've got a real simple nonlinear shear spring um, model generator. And then in the current release, we've got something from Henry Burton at UCLA that will automatically design a steel building and provide open seas models for that building, which we then go off and perform the analysis with. And also important in this tool is, you know, where do we get the earthquake events for a particular building at a specific location? And here we have a number of options available, stochastic, stochastic ground motion generators. Um, if the user has a number of peer AT2 files, um, we also will search the peer NGA using multiple target spectrum. And finally, we do site response with random fields through the different soil layers. So the next tool up in the chain is PDE. Here we're basically adding damage and loss calculations to the end of an either a, an earthquake simulation or a wind simulation. The damage and loss calculations right now are hazardous and P FEMA P P58 calculations. And the tool we're using to do the damage and loss calculations is an application called Pelican. Greg mentioned it earlier in his presentation, which which they're using to do the damage and loss calculations for their, for their buildings in the CEA project. So this is Pelican. Um, my postdocs come up with great names for their tools. The Pelican stands for the probabilistic estimation of losses, injuries, and community resilience under natural disasters. Um, it is a framework for build, for creating applications that do damage and loss. Um, there are different options available. And it was built starting off so that could, we could do sort of P, FEMA P58 calculations on earthquakes. Um, it was extended to include hazards calculations for the earthquakes. And then we've been working it out for the different hazards. For example, we're, we've got a wind, we can now do wind, cal, wind damage and loss estimates. And we're also water, the storm surge damage and loss estimates. And then we're working, for, you know, not just buildings, we're also looking at other lifelines, for example, water pipelines, gas networks, um, and transportation systems. So we're kind of building it out, you know, for the different hazards, um, different types of um, resources, and then building it from, you know, to have more precision as we get finer and finer details about, about what it is we're trying to do the damage and loss calculations for. But I say Pelican is just general framework for just doing the damage and loss calculations. So now I'm going to talk about our regional application, RDT. We have not yet released it. It is coming out this December. At least that's what we've told NSF. So what it is, is RDT stands for the Regional Resiliency Determination Tool. That's the current name I gave it. Um, We'll see if the postdocs come up with a much better name. But it's ultimately a tool for allowing users to look at what happens in a region given a natural hazard. Hazard will again be storm surge or hurricane. And here's an example of what the interface is looking like for inputting an earthquake hazard. The user is going to select a region, um, you know, define the grid, given the read, then they're also going to define, you know, where exactly the earthquake rupture is. Um, what ground motion prediction equation to use. We'll go off to OpenSHA, get some um, models, some rupture objects, as they call them. Um, and then we'll use stuff from Jack Baker to you know, get some correlated ground motions for the individual points on the grid. 
And then once we have the buildings, we'll just run it through our, our simulation. And the postdoc put in a little video up there for me. Let me go on. So this is RDT, the design. Remember all our applications, they have a front end and the back end. The front end to RDT will be called RDT. The back end we're calling our well because we've released our well and we're, we're using it now. It's available to use on Design Safe now. And there's something I'm also showing in this slide. I'm showing Brails. We'll talk about Brails in a little minute, but Brails is basically for creating the building information models that we need to run, to run our, our regional simulations. So here's an example of what we've done with our well. We did a San Francisco Bay Area test bed that had 1.8 million buildings and we used a 7.0 haywired scenario that came from um, Brook, Brook, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, Dave McCallum's group at LB, LBNL. And then right now we're running this Atlantic City test bed where we're looking at hurricane and storm surge on Atlantic City in the state of New Jersey. That's an 80,000 building um, inventory we're looking at there. Um, we've also done a test bed in Anchorage, um, that 7.1 that happened back in 2018. Um, we created a workflow for that with a number of different options. Given some building infantry ground motions, we calculated the ROS ratio and we were able to come up with some you know, rough red tag information. We looked at it doing a number of different ways. Um, we look at the recorded ground motions from the event and then we used a procedure similar to what um, I just showed for the earthquake selection using peer NGA to go off and get some correlated ground motions. And they see we, we get different results for both. And then what do we do with the results? Um, well, we showed, um, we showed the, the PIs on the project. Basically, we could upload them as um, ArcGIS story maps where the users could, you know, have a look at, at the results. Um, other researchers could have a look at the results, download them. And, you know, when ArcGIS, you can go in there, you can zoom in at the individual parcel level um, and see the results for the individual buildings. Of course, when we go down to the parcel level, we have to put a big disclaimer on this. Um, you know, this are, these are all research. You know, the building may or may not behave like it is. And we're working with DesignSafe now for, you know, they don't want us to use the ArcGIS story maps. DesignSafe would like to put up their own application. Again, where the postdoc is just showing you moving around a bit. And then here's the fun part of this presentation. Basically, data collection and usage. Um, where do we get that building inventory from? Like, how do we how do we start off? We need something to start with. Um, we need to know the buildings. You know where they're located, the number of stories, what year they're constructed. Um, for the damage and loss, you have to know um, what their usage. So, how do we get that information? So that's this data collection and processing part of this presentation. So the data, there's an awful, as we all know, there's an awful lot of data out in the, out in the web. Um, and this is, this part of the presentation is basically how do we go get that data? And how do we use that data to get the information that I need so I can run my, my regional simulations? So the first thing we usually start off, we need to know the, the basic inventory. Um, so here's an example where we can use web automation. automation. Um, and a package here, we're using a package called Selenium. It's not the most efficient, but it's the one that you know people like to see because every, when you run this thing on your desktop, you, a web browser will keep popping up every second as it goes off and gets the data from the assessor's website. That data is stored in files. And then once we have all the files, once we've scraped through the website and we've got all the files, we then create our, our building information model. The assessor's offices are not always up. They don't always like you scraping. So another way to get data is we can go to the Microsoft Footprint database. They have a database showing the footprint for buildings collected over the United States. They have 125 million footprints or so um, for buildings in, the, in different parts all over the country. And you can use that as a starting point that basically for each building, they'll give you a polygon from which you can determine the area and the centroid. 
And from that, we can go off and get state stuff. So when we start with the, the building inventory from Microsoft or even from the assessor's office, there's usually missing data um, or we need other data in, a, in our workflows about the buildings. So how do we get this other data? And this is where we're using AI and machine learning. Um, you all know what AI is, but let me just sort of the definitions I'm working with here today. AI is an application that if a human carried out the same thing, we would say the human had applied intelligence to accomplish the task. And machine learning is a specific form of AI in which the applications learn from the data rather than through explicit programming. Um, types of machine learning are supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is where you provide it with, for example, um, labels. In the example here, you know, we're, we're, we find a number of labels, we label ducks and non-ducks. Um, we train the network on these labeled images. And then subsequently we come along with an image. And if that image is a duck, our software will tell us if it's a duck or not. Uh, unsupervised learning is we just give it a bunch of images and we don't do anything, we provide no labels and the software will group those images into different, different groups. And from that, we can do things. Reinforcement learning is where the algorithms interact with um, the environment um, to do things. For example, self-driving cars use reinforcement learning. Now AI is used quite widely in natural hazards. Um, I'm not going to go into all the uses. Um, earthquake early warning systems, ground motion simulation, um, pre-earthquake damage prediction, post-earthquake damage prediction. Um, they do it in floods. They use it in hurricanes, you know, predicting the hurricane winds and also predicting the damage that it will be caused by a hurricane. Um, the Sim Center state-of-the-art report version two which Greg is actively trying to get out the door, hopefully by December 2020, we'll have a new section on AI in which there's references to all to a number of different AI uses in natural hazards. Um, for example, showing here uh, one that the Sim Center did where we go from a building description to come up with a structural analysis model using experimental data and how people modeled that experiment. So the Sim Center's AI efforts in regard to the regional simulation, that's in a package we call in Brails. Um, again, as the postdoc came up with the name, but it, Brails stands for building recognition using AI at large scale. Brails like Pelican is a framework for generating inventories um, for, the, for our regional simulation. It's gonna again consist of modules um, that do different things. For example, one module might just determine the roof shape Another module might determine the foundation type. And then there's gonna be workflows that will link those modules together, depending on what type of simulation you're doing. For example, if I'm doing a hurricane simulation, I'm gonna need the roof shape, window covering area, um, pitch of the roof, uh, first floor elevation. Um, so that there'll be a workflow for that. Whereas if I'm just doing an earthquake simulation, I might not need the roof shape. Um, I just might need the foundation type. So there'll be different workflows that will put those modules together. And this work is all being carried out by the people on the screen there. So here's a quick one, um, identifying roof shapes, our first example. So basically for our hurricane test bed in Atlantic City, we need to know the roof shapes. Um, there's three types of roofs, flat roof, hip roof, or a gabled roof and that we have software that will determine that. So let's just talk quickly about machine learning. Um, we're running a program on a computer that's gonna predict what the, what the roof shape is. As a, you all know, computers are incredibly stupid things. They do um, very simple things. They can store numbers, they can store data and you know, zeros and ones. They can add numbers, multiply numbers, divide. Um, and they can do if statements. Um, so to, do, to label an image, basically we're gonna um, run, run it through a function 
that function is going to take as input x, which is a vector. That vector is basically, if we have a 640 by 640 image, the vector size is 640 by 640 by the number of, you know, if it's RGB, it might be 640 by 640 by three. But that's the vector that's coming in. And then the computer algorithm, all it is is some function that's going to take that vector input and compute three numbers at the output. In this case, whether the, the probability that the roof is flat, gabled, or hit. Um, a lot of work is done in training that network with existing images. Um, well, when training, when building up these networks, um, there's an, a number of ways that these things can be used. And that is the sort of the art of machine learning. Um, you can do, create, for example, you could, you could create a machine learning algorithm that brought in different components that already exist um, and put it together. So I could have, if I gave three postdocs the same task, the three postdocs would all come back with different algorithms that would be doing the same thing. Now these, these machine learning algorithms are not 100% accurate. We gain accuracy by including more labeled images or again, different approaches um, to the approach. And if you want a really good um, brief introduction to what you can do with machine learning and how to use it, we recently did a bootcamp. Um, its link is there. And the chapter seven, um, the postdoc, when he was presenting uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, is a good example. He, the example he used was actually this roof detection. Um, so if you want, you could spend an hour and you could write a machine learning algorithm to detect roof shapes if you wanted to. So now we just do a couple more examples. This is a little, um, a little task we had. We were trying to, for our regional earthquake, we were trying to um, determine soft stories. You know, could we use the soft story in our, in our evaluation of the damage and loss? So to do that, we had to determine, you know, do the buildings have a soft story or not? Um, so we, we spent some time looking at ways if we could determine the soft story. And all I'm trying to indicate here is that for this case, we, you know, the, the algorithms got a little bit more specialized in that we basically had first, before we could um, identify well that whether it was a soft story or not, we first of all had, had to identify the building um, in the image. And from then we could get a finer, um, you get a better result on our, on our classification as to whether it was a soft story or not. Other things we can do, this is, this is, this is not image classification, this is object detection, which is another type of machine learning algorithm, basically detect the number of objects um, in an image. Here we're trying to determine the number of stories and the, the postdoc decided to use object detection to determine the number of stories where each object is a, so you see that in the, in the image there, it's the, the, um, the number of, I'm oh, sorry, the, he, he blocked out the, the windows at each story. So they, they are objects and then the software determined the number of those objects that were in an image. And there's of course other ways to do it, but that's the way he wanted to do it. So one other way to do it would be to you know, get out the number of lines in an image. So this is what I'm showing here. We could actually determine from the number of lines in the image. And then once we have a whole bunch of software that does stuff, we can start calculating things from the software. For example, here we're starting off with um, the Bing Maps, the Google, uh, and we're using Google Street View and satellite image to get data from the satellite image. You know, from the Street View, we're rectifying it. We're planar rectification to go from a perspective view to a planar view. Um, then we're doing facade segmentation to figure out, okay, this is the roof, where are the windows, where is the foundation in the image? And then once we have that, we're actually going in and do um, calculations on the roof height, foundation height, um, and window areas for the building. And what I now want to quickly talk about is SURF. Um, if you spend a lot of time trying to get your stuff from images, not not everything is always visible. When you go to Google Street View and try and look at a house, you might instead just get an image of a hedgerow, you might get a wall, or you might get a, a fence around the building. So there's just 
some buildings, um, less in the urban areas, but a lot more in the, out, out in the urban areas where you just can't actually see what the building is. Uh, so from there, we have software that will fill in that missing information. We call it SURF, Spatial Uncertainty Research Framework, and it fills it in based on, based on probability. So this basically then is Braille's, how it works. We have our city of interest. We start go off and get metadata about you know, where the buildings are. We do some geoencoding, then we can use satellite and Google Street View to get images of the building. We use machine learning to fill in the information for we have for the individual buildings. And then for those buildings where we just can't figure out anything, then we're just gonna fill it in with, with some probability. And that gives us our building inventory. Sim Center is also about community building. We have workshops, um, boot camps, both on how to use our tools and more importantly on how to program. I'm all about helping people how to program. We release educational applications. And also we have our state of the art report as I mentioned earlier and version two is coming out soon that we'll have that section on AI. You can see how AI is being used in natural hazards engineering. We of course have our test beds, uh, which are generating some excitement in at least the research community. Um, actually the state of New Jersey is using our, um, is quite happy that we're looking at the, the hurricane in New Jersey um, because they, they, have a, they had a large effort there and they had nobody who had actually ended up doing the damage and loss calculations for them. So they're quite happy that we're stepping in to fill in the, the damage and loss. Finally, your feedback is needed. Um, feedback drives our tool development. Pretty much NSF tells us really the things we should be working on are, are user requests, user feedback. Um, so we need to get as much user feedback as possible telling us to work on different, different applications. With Steve gone, we, we need the ideas. So thank you for listening. Okay, Janelle. Yeah, that, that was excellent. Thank you very, very much. Um, I don't see any questions in the box, but I think I, I think anybody who who's heard me muse uh, about um, mitigation, I have a tremendous hope for this kind of uh, remote sensing and simulation, AI, machine learning to provide vulnerability inventories. Um, you know, I think that. In, in my unique position of being able to fund mitigation activities, the first thing that our funders, meaning FEMA, ask is how big is the problem? Yep. Um, so it's just very exciting. So is this something that, I mean, I, I keep looking for grants that I can get that can help you and others develop this. Is this something that is is close? Does it need a, a lot of development? Where are well, we? I'll put it this way, RDT is very close to going out. Um, it's going to do a rough regional simulation. Um, you know, there, there's just so much potential to improve what we're going to do. Um, it's like, I consider like when I released, op I, I released a program called Open Seas. When I released it originally, it had four element types. We had elastic beams for two and 3D at a truss, a zero length. And I had four elements or four materials, uniaxial, elastic, perfectly plastic, um, and a series in a parallel model. Um, 20 years later, I've got a couple of hundred elements and a, you know, another few hundred materials. So we're hoping, I'm hoping this, this, this thing will, this similar approach, you know, we're providing real basic rudimentary stuff. Um, research, you know, there's obvious, people, there's obvious things that could be improved. For example, right now, our regional earthquake is not taking into account um, soft stories. Um, we have really rough estimates of coming up with models for the, the buildings we put in the different parcels. Um, so there's just so much, so much research that could be done to improve the results that finally come out. Um, I think it's, you know, so I'm hoping it'll, you know, open up um, research to a whole new, a whole new generation that's coming along behind us, you know, um, that are interested in doing large scale simulations. Right. Well, and I think, um, you know, when we listen to people talk about potential new research in the last session, 
Um, you know, Evan Reese brought up the notion of a you know post-event damage assessment, and I think there's so much uh, possibility for this kind of remote sensing to do that as well. Um, and the thing, you know, and the thing, you know, you could think of, you know, city planners, you know, they could they could have a look at what the damage might be. They can say, let's try a retrofit program. We'll give some incentive. Maybe figure out, okay, you know, so many buildings get improved. You run the simulation again. You can show them. Well, this, this you know, this is the, this is the effect if if you were to you know, put that program in place or put that policy change in place. Um, and then of course, in the back end, it's, you know, there's a whole area where it opens up, you know, what's gonna happen after a disaster? Right. How, does the, how does the community get back? What sort of algorithms can we come up with to see how the, how the community recovers and, you know, what, 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 where, what areas should we focus our investment in? Um, you know, where do we fix the roads, the lifelines to get the, the thing back up and running? Yeah, awesome. Anybody yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we hear you, Alid. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I, I had to reschedule my talk a little bit to do my uh, class teaching duty. So uh, it, it has been, a, I have been attending most of the talks except the one I had to go teach and it, it has been very useful and informative, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so I will try to present you some of the things we are doing in PEER uh, related to artificial intelligence supported structure health monitoring and earthquake reconnaissance. But uh, as, a, as the PEER director, I have to tell you a little bit about PEER for those who are, do not know what PEER is. Uh, we are a group of uh, 20 universities, 11 core institutes, uh, nine educational affiliates. Uh, all the core institutes are in the West Coast where earthquake is uh, uh, an important hazard and uh, all of us work towards this integrated performance-based uh, engineering methodology for many years now. That has been the backbone of the activities within uh, PEER. Uh, PEER has several sponsors. Uh, I put an arrow next to CAA, uh, so I remind myself to thank CAA uh, again for uh, that uh, wonderful project that put all this brain power of the uh, PEER CAA team behind uh, uh, an important problem that, that uh, makes a difference to uh, the whole residents of the state of California and the West Coast in general. We also have several other sponsors that I'd like to uh, thank them for their continuing support over the years. This is how PEER uh, stays uh, alive with all its activities. So now switching to what we do in the peer activities of artificial intelligence to reduce consequences of earthquakes. And I'll talk to you about three things uh, that we are doing. Uh, all three are related to structure health monitoring and earthquake reconnaissance. Uh, the first is image-based uh, deep learning. Uh, the, the second is uh, text-based uh, natural language processing. And the third is vibration-based machine learning. You can get more information from this website, this uh, uh, Structure Artificial Intelligence Research Lab uh, that we are starting at, at UC Berkeley. So there was an interesting special edition of the Time magazine that, uh, that focused on artificial intelligence. And in this edition, you see how artificial intelligence is actually penetrating every aspect of our life, from face recognition to rescue robots, uh, deep space application, even in computer gaming, AlphaGo, and medicine application, and natural language processing, uh, and many more. So before I, I get into the three applications I want to talk to you about, I wanna give you this uh, 30,000 mile vision of, of where AI fit into the way we do things. And again, th this is, could be debated. Others may think differently, but 
we have been doing a data to knowledge life cycle for many years. And this numbering is correct. There is no typo here. Starting with number two, which is we go to the field and we have field observation and we gather field observation. And then we go to try to develop an informed hypothesis driven research. And then we move on to try to uh, operationalize the, 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 the outcome through some regulatory mechanism uh, for a top down mitigation measures. And this is where uh, an organization like CAA may come in uh, in issues like residential earthquake insurance or uh, mitigation strategy and so on. And then we circle back or we propagate back to the affected community. So this life cycle of data to knowledge is wonderful and has been doing us a, a good outcome uh, from engineering point of view and code development and so on. So we are trying to think of something a little different is to say, well, through this uh, steer network where peer is involved, this is the structure extreme events reconnaissance, is to say, well, we need a few conduits in this life cycle that start by positioning a partnership nexus at the center of this cycle, that's where A is, such that we can include these pathways to the affected communities. So then we can establish a better communication with researchers to translate the, the high uh, value knowledge and the spur new research and education activities starting from this field observation. So this is where these arrow, uh, arrows in orange are trying to do. This is where I think AI uh, uh, and its capability to transform data to knowledge uh, uh, that can make a difference in having informed decision to reduce earthquake and other uh, hazards consequences. So zooming in now to this uh, picture that uh, Janiel has shared with us, and to use this as an example, uh, I will doctor this image a little bit and say, well, what if we put a bunch of sensors to collect data on this structure? What if we have the standard way of collecting images with cameras and on a snap or whatever, or something more sophisticated like a robot that in one of my labs, I, we are building this robot. That's actually something my group is building where we have a depth camera that's attached to a microcontroller or a Raspberry Pi that's on a vehicle that this thing can move around and collect pictures. So then you can have an AI based detection for the presence, severity or location of damage using the standard images or a prototype as such. Uh, and also possibly using other type of sensors for real time assessment following an earthquake. You can also do other things uh, like this AI uh, based documentation of the consequences of an earthquake using social media data or news articles or uh, in addition to the USGS hazard information. So I will talk more in detail about this, but this just to give you uh, the big picture and then a more focused picture of relevance to what you have heard in the past two days. So let's go one by one. The first application is image-based deep learning. There's a lot of work going on on uh, applications of deep learning and image classification in all sorts of applications. However, visual inspection is still the main approach for structure health monitoring and earthquake reconnaissance. If we use deep learning, uh, 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 for vision-based SHM and earthquake reconnaissance, we can achieve two very important goals. We can replace a labor-intensive repetitive tasks to benefit not only engineers, but also homeowners. We can increase the efficiency of the process of learning from earthquakes, which is the start of this uh, data to knowledge cycle I told you about 
or even it's a revised version with all these conduits uh, that we are trying to add with that uh, nexus that's inserted in the center uh, of this life cycle. So what did we do about this? First thing we did is we developed this uh, FeeNet or Peer Hub ImageNet, uh, which is an open source uh, uh, database that has uh, 36,000 images. The, the important thing is not the images. The important thing is the fact that these images are annotated and labeled by experts for eight benchmark uh, uh, detection tasks. You can access everything in uh, this database. As I said, it's open source. There is also a peer report that explain the data ontology, it explain the relationship between these tasks and the labeled uh, images. So that's all uh, available at, at the moment. So just to show you a few examples, these are the three of the eight tasks uh, related to damage level, related to spalling condition for concrete structure or damage type. Uh, and this can get into more sophisticated and expert opinion who would know the difference between a flexure crack and a shear crack. It's not a matter of saying, oh, there is a piece of concrete that fell off here, uh, like, like in the spalling condition. But to be able to distinguish between flexure and shear, that required the expert opinion in the annotation and labeling of these images. And this is where all the effort uh, uh, went into. So what's behind this data set? Behind this data set is a, a deep convolutional neural network, which is simply a way of developing the relationship or the mapping function between the image and the label, like, like a spawning condition. It combines the RGB, the, the red, green, and blue of each pixel of the image in a way to find the best possible relationship uh, commonly, we use this CNN or convolutional neural network by stacking layers. These layers come in different, they, they fulfill different tasks like convolution tasks or pooling tasks. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of that. Uh, so the important thing is the more the number of these layers, the better the learning. Uh, we can improve uh, on this type of network by having some iterative processes like connecting the different layers. So they generate other kind of network like this residual network. At the end of the day, uh, these different layers and networks produce something, uh, uh, oops, let me go back, uh, produce something like what you see here uh, as a probability of the different classes of what you are trying to classify. So this image of a column here, we, wanna, we want the network to be able to tell us, are there, is there a spalling or not? So what happened in this particular example is the network is telling you there is a 0.2% chance that there is no spalling and 99.8% chance it corresponds to a spalling condition. So uh, clearly the network is doing the right thing. 36,000 images may seem like a lot, but it's by no means a lot of data. If you, if you look at what uh, Professor Fifi Lee in Stanford has done when she developed the, her uh, ImageNet database, she has 15 million images and all of them are annotated. Uh, our 36,000 images is, is a pathetic number compared to that, but we are not gonna stop because of this. Uh, instead, we will say, well, we can actually use uh, Fifi Lee's 15 million images because she has a lot of objects. All of them are labeled. Many of them are of relevance to structure engineering application. And the network we're trying to develop, try to identify features. When you look down to these features, these features come to be lines and dots. Uh, uh, the line represents a crack. If the crack is inclined, it could be a shear crack. If the crack is horizontal or vertical, could be a flexure crack. So at the end of the day, you try to identify these lines. Same features can be detected by the larger data set because they are very basic features. So we can use what is called the source domain with very large data set, like this 15 million images in ImageNet, uh, 
determine a lot of features in the uh, network or train the network for a lot of basic features. And then part of the, 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 the related part to the target domain, which is the structured image net, now can be trained as a classifier of the eight tasks we are interested in. That's what's called transfer learning in one slide. And this work has been published and, and, and you can read more about it in this paper. But basically we take the uh, uh, basic features that are trained by a very large data set from done by others, benefit from that. The work we have done with the 36,000 images can fine tune and refine the network for the additional tasks we want to do. Difference between spalling, no spalling difference between flexure and shear, <clears throat> and so on. Uh, so when you train with 36,000 images, eventually you have to test. So you test with unseen data. So these are few images that we, we had from Chi Chi earthquake in 1999 in Taiwan that we did not use for training. And we tried to uh, run them through this classifier for the eight tasks, and we were pretty successful uh, in seeing that the computer does the right thing for the scene level, telling us whether this is a pixel or an object or a whole structure, the damage state, whether it's damaged or no damage, the spalling condition, the collapse mode, and the component type. Sometimes the computer is confused, so as all of us, a distinguishing column from a wall can be tricky. So the computer will tell you, oh, it's a 50 chance it's a column, 50 chance it's a wall. Uh, that's the best it can do, but that's the best an expert can do by just looking at the picture. So going back to this image, and when I was asked to give this talk by, by Janelle and Grace, I wanted to do something of relevance to uh, this project. So we took this image and then I asked uh, a couple of people I work with in my group, I said, let's try these images using our uh, model that's trained by our FeeNet. Let's see what we're gonna get. And if we get good results, I'll show it. Uh, if we didn't get good results, I'm not gonna embarrass myself. I just gonna hide it under the rug and I will never show it and just show the Chi-Chi stuff and, and that will get us the, the necessary recognition. So here, actually, we get good results. So this sim, don't confuse the sim with what Frank showed. Uh, this is not the sim center. This is the structural image net model. We also abbreviate it as SIM. And this is the model that is developed, trained by the FeeNet. And here we put uh, for test this picture, and we looked at two tasks. These two tasks to remind you is the scene classification between pixel object and structure and the collapse, no collapse classification between no partial collapse and complete collapse. Of course, if Janine look at this picture or anyone look at this picture will say that's a full structure and there is no collapse here. But our model was telling us that it's 100% structure level it's a 97.3%, it's no collapse. Not too bad. So, and then I think Tara uh, uh, Hutchinson showed this picture. I, I think also it's from Napa probably. Uh, we, we also put this picture through the test and also it, uh, the, the model told us that it's 100% structure level and it's, 85% collapse with 15% possibly no collapse. Not so bad uh, uh, for uh, a computer uh, detection uh, algorithm. Uh, so what else do we do? We try to understand why the computer does what it does. So here is a picture of a spalling. It says 100% spalling. It's a 93% object. Object means a beam here, it's not the entire structure. And we use these algorithms uh, that will look at the pixel by pixel. It developed these so-called explainable uh, uh, saliency maps or pixel quality maps. Basically, it, it sees which pixel have been used to do the classification 
that this is a 100% spalling uh, scenario. And they generate these heat, uh, heat maps uh, uh, that for an algorithm that we put together out of two algorithms, this guided grading uh, uh, CAM algorithm, and it actually identify the right region of the picture that led the computer to understand it is indeed a pixel class or a, or a pixel class of that uh, 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 category. So that's very important, such that the AI is not taking place uh, in our blind spot. We want to know why the computer is doing what it's doing. This is not only for damage. We have been using that for a so-called semantic segmentation uh, for visual understanding of construction sites. Uh, we use the state-of-the-art uh, um, network. It's called Deep Lab version 3. Uh, this network does a very important uh, thing of, of uh, semantic segmentation of a picture. When you have a picture, uh, you can identify objects in the picture, but you want to label these objects with a meaning. This is a human being, this is a piece of equipment, and so on. And you want to do that fast. So our system can do that at 20 frames per, per second, which is not so bad. And you want also to add quantitative measure to this semantic segmentation. So I showed you the little robot that has a so-called depth camera. Uh, depth cameras are cameras that can identify distances, not only RGB pixel quality. So you have a picture here of an RGB image. You have the semantic map that says that the green is a man or a person and the red is an excavator on the site. But then you, you, uh, you locate also your depth camera that will tell you the distance of the different objects. When you line up the depth information with the semantic information, you can build a 3D visual understanding of the scene. In this case, it's the construction site. You can use that for resources allocation. You can use it for safety. You can use it for surveillance. So there is uh, a work done on that, and it's also uh, published. So now I switch to the second topic, which has to do with the vibration-based machine learning. And here you have sensors. The California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program has a lot of sensors uh, uh, that you can also benefit from the data that's coming from these sensors. But if we go back to the way the process uh, of the structure health monitoring work, you start by asking yourself what to observe, how to observe it, collect the data through some sensing layers, do pre-processing, feature extraction, pattern recognition, then make a decision where and when to modify uh, uh, such that you have a better performance. So what we do in that regard is we try to ask ourselves, is there damage or no? Uh, so that's the overall diagnosis, location of damage, that's the localization, damage severity or damage location, that's the uh, local severity. And for that, we also train a model uh, using data, similar to the way of training a model using images. Sometimes we couple it with analytical model. And we have a model now that we can test for future cases. The, the network we use in that regard is referred to as long short-term memory. Name is a little confusing, but the reason is unlike images, when you have a time series like acceleration recording or uh, something that changes time, you need to find the, the dependencies between uh, the different data pieces. Uh, that's through these little cells here uh, that operate on a certain segment on time, but you also need the overall uh, weights and biases that you estimate that takes into account the long-term dependencies. So that's why we use this kind of network. So instead of going into details, I'll just show you an example of a shaking table experiment that was done uh, by, by a group that we collaborate with in China. And this is a steel structure, three-story structure. It has uh, braces that work only in tension. So you can have modes of failure that's partial loosening of the braces or complete loosening of all of them, depending on the amount of shaking. And I'll just show you results. Uh, so 
these accuracies, which are very impressive, it's the number of correct prediction uh, normalized by the total predictions. And you see numbers that at least 81% accuracy for tasks like overall damage diagnosis, damage versus no damage, or even harder tasks like localization, is this damage in the first floor, second, or third? Or even local damage pattern identification, which is even harder, undamaged versus partial damage versus full damage, and at what level as well. So it's very successful uh, way of looking at unseen data with models that uh, are as sophisticated as this long short term uh, uh, memory uh, models that, that look at these time series. So the success of all this relies on having sufficient data. We, we usually have a lot of data of undamaged structures and fewer data of damaged structures. So we also developed this so-called human machine collaboration, where we use a, a, a data-driven machine learning model, like, like the examples I showed you. And if we understand the region of the undamaged in a certain space of features, these features could be peak values or cumulative values and so on. And if new data comes in like this uh, uh, yellow dot, and it falls within this cluster, so we classify that as no novelty, or it's not an outlier for looking at it in a different way. If it's far away from the cluster, then it's novelty. But it doesn't mean it correspond to damage, because maybe all the blue dots are coming from small shaking. What if you get a big earthquake? It doesn't mean the Trans-America Tower has collapsed. It just means the Trans-America Tower hasn't seen this big earthquake before. Our data doesn't have that blue cluster. It's not within the blue cluster. This is where we invoke the physics-based model. So, so if the observation says it's not normal, th then we, we, we bring this physics-based model, which could be a single degree of freedom model or a 3D finite element model that then can tell us whether this novelty is really damage or no damage. For the interest of time, I'm not showing you examples of this human machine collaboration. Last Friday, I give a talk for the SMIP 20, and I showed a lot of examples about that. If anybody interested, I'll be happy to share this presentation or send you the paper about this human machine collaboration work that we are doing. But now I want to switch to the last application, which is this uh, natural language processing for earthquake reconnaissance. Natural language processing is a subfield that's between linguistics and computer science and artificial intelligence. It's concerned by the interactions between computer and human language to process and analyze large amount of uh, data, natural language data. We use that in two aspects. We use it to automatically generate earthquake briefing and reporting. Uh, using information from USGS for hazard and in use uh, website data. Uh, we also use it to extract information related to earthquake consequence on a short term, uh, what we can call recovery time with the terminology of resilience. And this can use social media data like tweets. So I'll show you uh, a few examples of that. This is done under the umbrella of STEER. Uh, Tracy uh, Kajewski Korea is the leader of that, and the other uh, people are in charge of different hazards. Uh, PEER is involved in the earthquake part, and I, I am directly involved in that. You can learn more about the STEER network from the STEER.network website. Uh, so what do we do? We, we look at US, once an earthquake happened, USGS information is extracted, news information is extracted. So we have the hazard information, we have building data or building damage information, other infrastructure information, and also resilience effect uh, information for the affected community. And we put that in a briefing that we typically generate within 24 hour to 48 hour uh, time span. Uh, this, for example, was 
uh, the earthquake that happened, I believe, in Albania or something. Uh, so the pipeline for that uh, is uh, in generating these reports is we get the automatic news collection. We extract uh, uh, several sentences from this news. We classify each sentence uh, with some keywords like building, infrastructure, resilience, and other. And then we collect these classified sentences in a summary and we put it in the briefing or we put it in the report. So the methods that used for classification are simple keyword matching or some machine learning methods that were trained in advance uh, using things like logistic regression or support vector machine or CNN that I mentioned before or other uh, uh, semi-supervised learning. I believe Frank mentioned the difference between supervised and unsupervised uh, learning. So this is somewhere in between. And then we use a so-called majority voting uh, between these uh, uh, machine learning methods uh, uh, to come up with the right classification of the different sentences. So I'll show you an example of the earthquake that happened last year in Albania, which caused a lot of damage. And uh, several sentences from previous reports and uh, briefings that were done manually were used for training the different machine learning algorithms. And here I show you an example of 130 sentences that were extracted uh, from the news articles about this earthquake. So the, the second column, you see the training accuracy, which should be high. Uh, and then running uh, these algorithms on these 130 sentences, the keyword matching wasn't that great. It was only about 35% successful. But when we did the majority voting uh, with the other four machine learning uh, tools, we got twice as good of accuracy, 70% accuracy. Not too bad, but keep in mind that the training was done was not a very large data set, about uh, 200 or 300 sentences. If we have more of that, we can actually achieve a better uh, match uh, uh, in the test case. Uh, the last thing about the recovery time uh, or resiliency curves. So here recovery time, we can get that from social media data. is based also in keywords that we detect in the tweets, which are related to recovery, things like school or transportation, uh, which appear uh, at a high frequency once an earthquake happened and then this frequency diminish over time. Uh, so the idea is we, we look at these different keywords, how frequently they are repeated in the collected tweets, and we look at uh, uh, like this uh, red arrow or orange arrow in the beginning is the onset of the earthquake. And then over time, the word school diminishes or word related to office, uh, back uh, to operation diminishes. And if we take a threshold, let's say 15% of the max, uh, you can get a time that you can claim with some confidence that this correspond to some normality of the operation. When it comes to school, it took about seven days. When it comes to office, it took about three days. Uh, and keep in mind, this is a short-term recovery. It has nothing to do with repairing the columns that were damaged in the school. That, that, that will take months. Uh, so this is also an example. Uh, that's probably my last slide uh, on this uh, uh, Erzincan uh, Turkey earthquake that happened this year. And these steps correspond to different systems, uh, like the water distribution system, the power distribution system, and this comes from the tweets of people in that particular region or a rapid survey following an event. And again, you can quantify that recovery curve. You can relate it uh, to what people do in, in, in resiliency research. It can give you an idea about this community, uh, what you need to do in terms of reducing the recovery time or reducing the disruption. Uh, so you can minimize this area R so you can achieve more uh, resiliency of, of, of the community or of the region. And uh, to conclude, 
uh, I can say that artificial intelligence has great potential to reduce consequences of earthquakes. That's kind of obvious. Uh, Image-based, vibration-based, text-based AI methods uh, have been developed within peer improvements are in the way. Uh, the methods are applied to structure health monitoring and earthquake reconnaissance in a variety of applications. Some of them are analytical, like what we did with the human-machine collaboration. Some of them are experimental, like the three-story uh, steel structure with braces I showed you. And some of them are field observation, like the images we collect or uh, uh, the tweets and uh, uh, news articles after earthquake. Uh, the effectiveness of the methods are demonstrated with high accuracy, uh, something we, we should not bypass. We as engineers, we, we should benefit more from all these developments in this area. Uh, we are a big advocate of the human-machine collaboration methods, uh, even though I didn't tell you much about it, uh, but it's, it's a way of combining advantages of data-driven machine learning methods and physics-based simulation uh, it, we have been doing this work for a few years and uh, we have showed uh, quite a bit of successful uh, detection tasks and severity of damage tasks uh, uh, from several applications. And with that, I thank you and uh, hopefully I didn't take too much time and be happy to answer questions. Well, hi, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And I, I, I don't have any questions registering yet. I'd like to invite Grace and Yusuf to pull up their, their video. Um, I, I think that this, this technology, as I, I keep saying to people, has such incredible um, uh, possibilities. And I um, really appreciate your, your coming back to, to us today and presenting. And um, I look forward to, to listening and hearing more about this in the future. Yusuf, are you on? Uh, yes, uh, I, I need 10 seconds, basically. I would, on behalf of our CEA, peer CEA project, I would like to thank CEA, especially Janelle, for her leadership. We could not do it without your support and encouragement. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and uh, thank you all. The presenters just did an amazing job and it has been such an interesting um, last couple of years, uh, just learning so much about what we have. Uh, Grace, uh, Aaron, Water, Aaron Rogers, <laughs> Jasmine Castro, um, thank you for your assistance with uh, the forum. It, it was just uh, more successful than I could have imagined. Too many people to thank, but certainly the project team Thank you, advisory team, and of course to our attendees, thank you. We hope to see you all again um, sometime in the near future, hopefully in person. So thank you all and um, have a, a very safe, uh, I guess we're going into the holidays. I don't know what month it is. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.